the patient should undress preferably down to their underwear. Then observe the patient for a few moments for evidence of breathlessness, pain or discomfort. Note the color and general appearance of the skin on their face and the limbs. Are they pale? Are they blue? Pink? Or do they have a yellow tinge? Then move into the inspection of the hands. When you shook hands, did you notice their temperature? And were they sweaty? Examine the nails for clubbing and splinter hemorrhages. Clubbing may be caused by bacterial endocarditis and cyanotic congenital heart disease. Clubbing is also associated with pathologies of the lungs, the liver and inflammatory bowel disease. Splinter hemorrhages, especially when proximal, may signify infectious endocarditis or vasculitis. Splinter hemorrhages may also be seen in manual workers, usually at the distal end of the nail, and may not be significant. Examine the fingertips and palms of their hands for Osler's nodes. These look like blood-filled blisters, which may be tender to touch. Note also the fingertips and nail beds for peripheral cyanosis. This could signify poor peripheral perfusion to the tissues, a cold patient, or suffering from Raynaud's phenomenon. Is the patient a smoker, and have you also noted any yellow nicotine stains on their fingers? Inspect the face for evidence of peripheral or central cyanosis. Blueness or cyanosis signifies poor tissue perfusion or the buildup of deoxygenated blood. Peripheral cyanosis is best observed on the tips of their nose and ears and also the fingers and nail beds. Then check the scleria of the eyes for evidence of jaundice and the conjunctival membranes for anemia. Examine her iris for a whitish ring. This may be corneal arcus. In an old person, this may not be significant, but in a younger patient, it usually signifies high cholesterol. Note the presence of xanthelasmas or fatty deposit nodules around the eyes. This could signify hypercholesterolemia or increased lipid levels in the blood. Ask the patient to open the mouth to show her tongue, the mucous membranes and the gums. Can you show me your tongue? Thank you. And can you lower your lips and show me your gums? Blueness of the lips, the tongue or the mucous membranes of the mouth signifies central cyanosis, often associated with cardiac failure or respiratory problems. Check the tongue for evidence of anemia. It may be red, smooth, shiny and sore. The state of their gums and oral hygiene may be significant in cardiovascular presentations. Patients complaining of headaches or pain in temporal area, you may need to examine and palpate the temporal artery. If the artery feels rubbery or tender to touch, this may signify temporal arteritis. This is a convenient point to follow on to the assessment of the pulse. Place the palps of your fingers over the radial artery and time the beats per minute. You can measure the pulse for 30 seconds, then multiply by 2. By taking the pulse for a shorter period, you may not be able to make a proper assessment of the quality of the pulse and you may miss irregularities in rhythm. In assessing the rhythm, you need to state whether it is regular, whether it is completely irregular, or just a few irregular beats such as extrasystoles. The quality of the pulse is best assessed with larger vessels like the carotids or the brachial arteries. The brachial artery is easily accessed in the elbow just medial to the bicep tendon. To check for a collapse in pulse, place your hand around the patient's wrist and then quickly elevate the arm. In aortic regurgitation, 
you will feel a sudden drop or thrill in the pulsations. You should also check the carotids as you may be able to observe a collapsing pulse. The carotid may be palpated just anterior to the sternomastoid muscle, midway up the neck. Palpating the lower section of the carotid rather than the higher section, you avoid the baroreceptors, which can cause a transient drop in blood pressure when compressed. To locate the carotid, place your fingertips lightly, just lateral to the thyroid cartilage, at the level of the larynx. Arrhythmias or irregular heart rhythm may take several forms. The occasional extra beat, followed by a dropped beat or a missed beat, may be of little significance, and this can be termed as ectopics or extrasystoles. A completely irregular rhythm may signify atrial fibrillation. The carotids may also be used to assess the character and waveform of the pulse. Palpation of the carotids may also reveal a slow rise in pulse, as seen in aortic stenosis. Blood pressure is best measured using a mercury sphygmomanometer. Ideally, the patient should have rested for at least 5 to 10 minutes and not eaten, drunk alcohol and smoked for about 30 minutes. Ensure that the calf size is suitable for the thickness of the patient's arm. Ensure that the patient's arm is free of all clothing and that it is comfortably resting supinated on a desk, tucked under your arm or by their side if they are lying down. Ideally, their arm should be at the same level as their heart. Position the cuff at about 2.5 cm above the antecubital crease. Students should practice by pumping at the cuff and feeling for the radial pulsations until they disappear. Note the level of mercury at which the pulsations are no longer felt. Then deflate the cuff and wait for 30 seconds and then start again. Position the stethoscope's headpiece in your ears and place the bell over the brachial artery. Pump up the cuff at a level of about 10 to 20 millimeters above that which you noted before. Start deflating the cuff very gently until the first sounds are heard. As the blood starts to push through the deflating cuff, the turbulent blood flow produces the Korotkov sounds followed by the systolic sounds. At this point, you need to note the systolic pressure. Continue deflating until the sounds gradually disappear. At the level when nothing can be heard, you note the diastolic pressure. The blood pressure is recorded systolic over diastolic, such as 120 over 80. Depending on case history and clinical presentation, you may decide to assess the blood pressure of the lower extremities. If you need to take the blood pressure in the lower extremities, place the thigh cuff above the popliteal crease and the stethoscope in the popliteal fossa. In the normal subject, the blood pressure in the lower limbs is about 15 to 20 mL higher than in the upper limbs. A blood pressure which is lower in the thigh is abnormal and it is suggestive of coarctation of the aorta or other occlusion. Next, assess the jugular venous pressure. Ensure that you understand the location of the internal jugular vein in the neck. To distinguish between carotid pulsations and venous pulsations, you need to bear in mind the following guidelines. Jugular pulsations have a double wave for each heart stroke. The carotid produces a single pulsation for each systole. Jugular pulsations are easily diminished with light finger pressure, whereas carotid pulsations are much more powerful. In the jugular, the most rapid movement is downwards during diastole, 
whilst the aortic pulsations cause a fast upward movement during systole. Jugular pulsations become more prominent as you lower the patient's head from 90 degrees to the horizontal level. Putting pressure on the patient's abdomen increases venous return pressure and will raise the level of the jugular pulsations in the neck. This is referred to as the hepatojugular reflux. For easy control of the patient's head, it is best to use an examination couch with an adjustable headrest. Position the patient's head and neck at 45 degrees. At this level, in a normal person, you should be able to see the jugular pulsations just above the clavicle. The JVP is measured in centimeters as a column of jugular pulsations reaches a vertical height in relation to the clavicle. Let us now measure the jugular venous pressure. I'm going to lower your head down and then bring it back up again. Okay. Look straight for me. In a normal subject, the jugular venous pressure should not exceed 3 to 4 centimeters above the manubrio sternal angle when sitting upright. 